Okay, so welcome to video 3 of 44. Uh, one of my least favourite topics today, development. Uh, this essay asks us to consider the extent to which primary product dependency, so we're going to need to define that, is the most significant constraint on growth and development. So there's an awful lot here to consider in the introduction. I need to set out what primary product dependency is. So to my mind, that's just where a country specialises in the production of a narrow range of goods and they're going to be in the primary sector. I need to assess the impact of this on growth and development. So I need to distinguish between growth, which is an increase in real GDP, and development, which is a broader measure of the quality of life, the standard of living in a country easy way to, to deal with that is to do the human development index and it's three aspects uh, mean years of schooling life expectancy and material standard of living so i need to talk about at some point in there some non-material um, aspects And finally, when I answer this question, I need to pick up on this idea of most significant, and I'm going to do that in my concluding paragraph. This is an easy one to write a judgment for right at the end. Okay, so if you haven't already, then I suggest you pause the video now, as ever, and come up with three points, three constraints, and three evaluative points here. You can write a judgment as well if you want. So the main problem I have, well, it's not really a problem with the first point, is that there is so much to say about the problems of primary product dependency. The first point to note is that if I'm only making one good, then I'm very vulnerable to shocks in the price of that commodity. If the price of that commodity falls, and a lot of these commodities, because they've got very inelastic PD, if the price falls, then I'm going to lose a significant amount of revenue. I'm going to lose far more than I'm going to gain down at the bottom. So this is a massive, massive problem for those countries and I can analyse it in terms of a change to aggregate demand. It's easy to support that because it's also likely that when the price of these commodities falls, companies won't want to go into the countries, they won't want to invest in them and extract those commodities. So there's also likely to be a lack of FDI, which contributes to the fall in AD. So I've got a massive problem here from exports and investment which I can analyse. Don't be fooled into thinking primary product dependency is only about oil. There's also a big problem um, for other countries like Uganda, where there's a, a heavy focus on agriculture, and that's probably subsistence agriculture. Very low productivity, very low opportunity to produce an excess that can be sold for export. So primary product dependency, does it cause problems for developing economies? Um, absolutely, and some good examples would be Angola or Uganda. There's also a, a lot to say about evaluation for primary product dependency. To what extent is it a problem? I think it's easy to make a case that actually it's a really significant problem. Um, and the answer lies in a market for one of these commodities. Think carefully about the price elasticity of demand, the price elasticity of supply. Both of them in commodity spaces are likely to be quite inelastic because it's hard to quickly increase output of them 
and they're often necessity, so demand is quite inelastic as well. This means that if there is a change in price, doesn't matter, sorry, in demand, it doesn't matter which direction that change is in, relatively small change generates quite a large change in price there. So for example, if there's a recession, as there is from time to time, people want less oil. Firms, for example, their demand falls, that leads to a big change in price, and therefore all the effects that we've just talked about on the previous slide become exaggerated. There's a big fall in export revenue, there's a big fall in um, investment into the country, and the, the problem's huge. So looking at the elasticities of demand and supply is an obvious evaluation uh, issue to raise. Although it might also be worth noting that obviously there are points in the economic cycle where some of these countries benefit significantly. So for example, when oil was $100 a barrel, certainly isn't any more, but when it was, Angola was generating a huge amount of cash for their economy. This essay wants me to think about what the most important constraint is. So the next thing I've got to do is look at some alternatives. And my go-to point with all of this is a lack of savings, because that allows me to fall back on the Harrod Domar model in order to develop my analysis. So the Harrod Domar model says that a country needs savings because savings get turned into investment investment gets well investment is the development of capital or capital accumulation effectively LRAS that turns into economic growth in the long run people earn higher incomes higher incomes get saved. So this is a, a positive cycle and when you can get an injection into one point of this cycle um, then we get takeoff in an economy and it moves through all the different stages of economic development. Now in developing countries we don't really have a large amount of saving uh, and there's a big constraint, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The first, and probably the most important one if you're looking for one, is the lack of a, a sensible banking sector, lack of financial markets. There's that stat if you're looking for some contextualised analysis, that 30% of people in rural Uganda actually save money but none of them have really done it in a bank. So this link here between savings and investment, the money never gets put into a bank, it just gets kept under the bed. Firms can't take it, they can't invest, so developing countries have a significant problem. So I think there's, there's plenty to say about that one. It's a nice straightforward point. It's easy to develop a chain of analysis using Harrod Domar. Um, the other point that probably just adds to that is that income levels are so low in some of these developing countries that there's a low marginal propensity to save. They can't afford to save, so again, there is no saving. They, don't, they can't afford to save and there's nowhere to save. So this is, a, this is a big issue in developing countries. Then I need to provide some evaluation. I need to look at the extent to which the inability to save becomes a problem and I can do that either by looking at how countries have actually saved in reality or schemes that have promoted saving. Now one thing that you could bring in here would be microfinance. Uh, I don't think you'd want to say a lot about it and if you look on page 248 of the textbook there is some information about it. Uh, it's just a an approach from, from Bangladesh um, th that allowed small groups of people to get access to credit that they otherwise wouldn't have had. So you can check Bangladesh there in your 
evaluation. The other point, which I think is probably slightly more obvious here, is that investment doesn't have to come from savings. It doesn't have to be internally generated. So I can skip the savings. I can cheat as an economy and I can directly attract investment. So I can employ strategies to promote FDI, for example, producing a little bit of infrastructure for foreign firms, or I can receive foreign aid which might come directly as new capital, or it might come as money for my government to spend on infrastructure or capital directly. So there are injections into Harrod Domar that just skip out the savings altogether, so perhaps it isn't the most important constraint. Okay, and my last point, there are so many different points that I could have put in here so this is just a sample of one I, I think the first two points are really strong so I'm just looking for something credible here to to give my answer a little bit of breadth um, one of the, the things on the spec and one of the things in the textbook on page 237 is the impact of HIV and AIDS and obviously this is something that affects a number of developing countries really significantly if you want a, a stat to throw in Botswana it's affected a really significant chunk of their working age population and I get some really easy chains of analysis going on um, it affects health negatively it's really obvious that affects the size of the labor force some people can't work that affects LRAS that affects economic growth um, but what I'm really getting here is I'm making a link to development. This is going to impact negatively on life expectancy. And that is one of the three parts of the human development index. So I'm making a link here, which I've not been good at doing so far, to development. So a major constraint on development is the impact of HIV and AIDS. Um, for the reasons that I've set out there. Evaluation is, is, there are a number of different routes you could take. I mean, one obvious point is that this disease has a really significant impact on people of working age. So if I'm looking at the extent of the reduction in the labour force, this disease has the potential to have a really significant effect. It's also not something that can be dealt with easily by foreign aid. So I think my evaluation here would be to give some reasons to indicate why it is so serious. Um, but on the other hand, it doesn't affect all developing countries um, in the same way. So Although it is very serious, it's not a problem that every country faces. So we need to be careful about um, making it the most significant uh, factor, I think. Uh, and the last job is to write a judgment right at the end to answer the question here about what's the most significant constraint. Um, I want to avoid repeating myself as ever. Um, I don't really want to introduce anything new. In this case, I'd probably just make the point that it is incredibly difficult to highlight one as the most significant. And the reason for that is because each developing country has its own unique set of circumstances, which is very different from the other. So, yes, in some countries where they have an abundance of resources, primary product dependency is, a, is the most significant constraint. But in other developing countries, there are other problems they don't even have uh, the, the blessing of resources that they, they have nothing um, and they have they have different challenges and I think I probably leave um, my judgment at that next time in essay four we'll have the pleasure of looking at strategies to promote growth and development in developing countries so until then